Welcome everyone. Today is Tuesday, December 13th, 2022, and this is a regular meeting of the City of Asbury Park Zoning Board of Adjustments. Chairman Avalon, will you please call the meeting to order? I'd be happy to. This meeting is being held in compliance with the Open Public Me Meetings Act, Chapter 231, Public Law 1975. Adequate notice of this meeting has been provided to the Coaster and Asbury Park Press by publication of the annual meeting notice and posted on the Municipal Bulletin Board and Municipal website. All notices are on file with the Board Secretary. Official action may be taken on the following matters before this Board. Fire exits are located on the east or west sides of the Council Chambers as well as the back of the building. I ask everyone to please mute their cell phone for the duration of this meeting. And this meeting is being recorded by APTV. Please call us to order, Marie. I will now take roll call. Daniel Harris. Here. Jill Potter. Here. Tim Slick is absent. Wendy Glassman. Here. John Scully. Here. Jose Alcaraz. Here. Vice Chair Russell Lewis. Here. And Chairman Christopher Avaloni. Here. All right, so we have just, I believe, one housekeeping issue. Um, is everybody eligible to vote on this, Marie? Hold up real quick. What is it? It's 1205 Pine. Um, the members that are eligible are Jill Potter, Wendy Glassman, John Scully, Daniel Harris, Tim Slick, who's not here, and the chairman. Okay, so, so I'll make a motion to approve the resolution of 1205 Pine Street. I'll second. Okay. One second. Okay. Second. Okay, then. Um, Jill Potter? Yes. Wendy Glassman? Yes. John Scully? Yes. Daniel Harris? Yes. Tim Slick is absent for this vote, and then Chairman Christopher Avaloni? Here, uh, yes. Yes. Okay, so first up we have 1109 Grand <laughs> Avenue. Mr. McEwen, welcome. Mr. Chairman, that matter was carried. Uh, from October 11th, and it was with uh, no further notice. We have jurisdiction to proceed. Great. Please proceed, Mr. McEwen, and welcome. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Good Chairman, you. members of the board. Robert M. McEwen, <clears throat> on behalf of the applicants, Andrew and Leanna Moss. Um, so just by way of the preface of the application, my clients own the property located at 1109 Grand Avenue, which a lot of people here probably refer to as the Woolworth House. Um, they purchased the house several years ago, and during COVID, they decided they wanted to purchase uh, an electric vehicle, which they did. They ordered it, came in. Um, but the problem is they need to, they, they want, would like to install a charging station on the property for their electric vehicle. Um, the property has no off-street parking. Um, it has no backyard, and it's a corner lot. It fronts on both 4th Avenue and Grand Avenue. So... Um, they're asking, obviously, for the, the uh, design waivers that are necessary for them to install the driveway to get to where the charging station is. They're gonna, we're going to put a, uh, they propose that they put a uh, parking stall in the, in the rear of the front yard and the parking stall would close, the car would be inside. The fence is to match what's currently there, but the applicant is open to you know, the board's considerations as to the, what they would like for the fence. So. Um, Call my first witness. Please do. Uh, Michael Wesolowski. So please raise your right hand. Tell me swear testimony without giving this matter the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Please state your name for the record and spell it. Please. First name Michael, M I C H A E L. Last name Wesolowski, W E. S E L O S K I. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Chairman, I believe Mr. Wesolowski has testified before. Will you accept his credentials? Um, I, I, I have not been familiar before. with you, yeah, Mr. You. Mr. Ms. Wesolowski. Which, Which board? Planning board, I have been. Yeah, yeah. not the zoning board. Correct. Okay. <clears throat> All right, Mr. Wesolowski, would you uh, explain to the board what your, your background is, your education, your credentials? Certainly. I am a project manager with Mid Atlantic Engineering Partners and a licensed professional engineer in the state of New Jersey. I've been practicing since approximately 2005 um, and have provided testimony in front of land use boards throughout the state. 
again, before your planning board, but not before this board. I accept your credentials. Thank you, Mr. Wesolowski. I hope I'm Chairman. pronouncing that correctly. I probably am not. <laughs> I think you are. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Wesolowski, would you like to explain to the board uh, basically where the property is located, the zone it's located in, and basically a summary of what the applicant's proposing here? Absolutely. I do not have an issue of activity in previous okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This one doesn't take fall. Hmm? This one doesn't take fall. Are they off? They turned off by themselves. They just automatically shut them off. You just want to go through. I'll just, just go through okay. if you want to ask any questions. Yeah. yeah. I like finishing the lines. Did that one blink up my head? Do you know if there are any other settings that have to be adjusted? Again, usually I have to just plug in and then I'm on screen. Yes. Please state your names for the record and your affiliation with the board. Michael Sullivan, Parquet Hands Board Planner. Thank you. Jason Fisher, Inside Engineer and Board Engineer. Thank you. Are we there? We are ready. We're ready. Please proceed. Thank you. Okay. The plan I have before you, which we can Mark A1, if that's appropriate. Sure. This is our variance plan. This was last revised 7-6-22. This was submitted to your attention. Uh, the main view that you see here, on the left-hand side are the existing conditions of the subject property. On the right side are the proposed conditions. I'll start on the left. Zoom in slightly for you. So as you heard, the subject property is known as Block 3401. Lot 8 contains just under uh, 5,900 square feet. Zone R1, single family residential zone. It's also known as 1109 Grand Ave, which is the frontage to the east. It also contains frontage along 4th Avenue to the north. And just to orient you a bit more, the property is about one block south of Sunset Lake and four blocks west of the ocean. Moving on to the right-hand side of this page, to give you a quick overview of the project and the application before you this evening. Uh, improvements are focused in the southeast corner of the property. Uh, first, we have a driveway, which will connect to Grand Avenue. Dry Island's parallel to the southern property line. It contains approximately 800 square feet. A portion of that driveway to create the desired parking space is wrapped in approximately 50 linear feet of six foot high wood fence. The east side of that fence is contain, contains a 12 foot wide gate, which is really two six foot wide gates that would allow the vehicle to enter and exit the parking area, as well as a single three foot wide gate for pedestrian access. And then finally, as you see here, located in southeastern corner, sorry, south, no, southeastern corner of that fenced area is the proposed electric vehicle charging station. But what I'd like to do from here forward is to take you through uh, your planner, Clark A. Hintz's letter, dated October 6th, and I'll touch on the majority of the comments therein. Let's have that marked as B1. I'm now going to 
bring out my next exhibit and mark A2. If that's appropriate. Sure. This exhibit here is a slightly updated version of the same plan. It was last revised today. It is unsigned. It has not been submitted. I'm presenting that as a new exhibit this evening. It only contains minor revisions, the first of which, uh, per conversation with uh, Ms. Miller, your planner, uh, we have modified and updated the front yard setback along Grand Avenue to be 25 feet. And per further conversation with her, we've relocated the electric vehicle charging station. It's previously in this corner, it's now in the opposite corner. That relocation is now a compliant location in terms of the front yard setback, as well as the accessory structure setbacks or set back to the southern property line. Moving on to comment 3.2, off-street parking. <coughs> the application requests a design exception. Again, one off-street parking space is proposed, whereas two are required for the city's ordinance. Uh, furthering that, we also are requesting a de minimis exception from RSIS. Again, one off-street parking space is proposed, where three are required for the, in this case, five-bedroom single-family home. Uh, bear in mind that with this application, there's no new residence or residential modifications proposed. It's simply the driveway application, uh, which takes it essentially from no off-street parking spaces to one, thus improving the existing condition. Okay. Moving along to comment 3.2 on page 4 of the letter. I'm sorry, 3.3. Location of off-street parking. Your city's ordinance defines front yard, and I'll read this, shall mean the exterior open area extending the full width of the lot between the street line and the nearest front wall of the building or structure. That being said, if we consider that nearest element to be the northeast corner of the porch, and we draw a line parallel with the right of way, the fence falls coincidental with that line, thus the parking area falls beyond the front yard. Furthering that comment, uh, on corner lots, a parking setback of 10 feet is required for other than the front street right of way. Uh, we're in full agreement with that, and that is one of the design exceptions we're requesting this evening. Moving on to comment 3.4, parking area landscaping. I'm going to toggle to third exhibit this evening. The underlying plan that you see here is the same exhibit I just prevented, excuse me, presented. I've added some colorized markups to demonstrate how we can comply with that landscaping requirement. Uh, should you consider the parking area to have dimensions of 9 by 18, mirroring that of a typical parking space, that would equate to 162 <coughs> square feet meeting the minimum 10% or at least 16 square feet of that area. Uh, to the north of the parking area, we can provide an approximately two by 14 foot planted strip equating to 28 square feet or 17% of that parking area, thus meeting that requirement. And I did want to backtrack a little bit. We want to do a little bit of due diligence and did some, some driving around the city and wanted to see what, what kind of situations of this, of this type might exist throughout the city. Um, I'll first toggle to, if we'd like to mark this as an exhibit, I believe this would technically become A4. This is simply a Google Maps image of the city outlined in red and all the red dots you see here are the locations that you'll see shortly where this situation exists. We've created a simple photo exhibit here. I won't take you through all of them. We found 29 locations, not saying that's all, but a, a fair representation of scenarios where you have the parking in the front yard, and in many cases, in front of the principal structure where no garage would exist beyond it. Giving you a few examples, I won't take you through all of these, but 200 Kingsley Street, in front of the principal structure, 302 <coughs> Avenue, 513 3rd Avenue, 
306 Fifth Avenue, another one in front of the principal structure, in front of the principal structure, 306 Second Avenue, and that, that trend continues. And again, I don't want to take you through each and every one of these. We, we appreciate that there are <laughs> other places that have a similar situation, Mr. Weslowski. You do not have to tell us. <laughs> exactly. I didn't want to take you through all of them. I thought I'd be insulting you. Uh, moving on to comment 3.5 regarding the fence. Uh, as I think I previously mentioned, it's approximately 50 linear feet of six foot high board on board fence to match existing. Uh, again, six foot high where four foot maximum height is permitted. Design exception that we have requested. Also that regarding the type of fence, a solid type is proposed, whereas on corner lots only open style fences are permitted. Pardon me if you want to just toggle back to our plan. The fence serves several purposes. As I mentioned, it's intended to match existing, which is really what any homeowner would want. It provides screening and security of both the parking area and importantly, the electric vehicle charger to prevent against any uh, foul play, for lack of a better term. Finally, comment 3.6, street trees. The ordinance requires one every 50 feet. The frontage accounting for both frontages is hang on a moment, 154 feet. Again, including both Grand Ave and 4th Ave. Divide that by 50. You have three required street trees and three exist today. We understand that your ordinance, if we're interpreting and reading everything correctly, does require a contribution if those trees do exist. If that is indeed the case, we would simply request acknowledgement of what that per tree contribution figure is for the benefit of our team and particularly our client. Uh, that concludes my testimony with respect to <coughs> CCH's letter. I would like to also briefly take you through your engineers, uh, Insight Engineering's letter. Be before you proceed with um, Insight's uh, mm -hmm. letter, uh, I just have a quick question. Sure. Did you consider not having the driveway on Grand Avenue and putting the driveway on 4th Avenue? We, we felt that given the, the constraints of the property and where certain structures were located, that Grand Avenue was the preferred location. But it would be able to be tucked a little bit further into the property and this along 4th yeah. uh, Avenue, as you can see here, there are also um, some HVAC structures out front mm -hmm. that I think the Grand Ave provides a better location for the driveway, provides better production, and allows everything to be. So you decided against the 4th Avenue cut? Yes. But also that Grand Ave really acts as the true frontage of the property. The front door is there. There are front porch, main entryways. Um, well, I understand that, but you understand that putting a car in the front of the house is, is against ordinances. Yes, and I, I think in either frontage, it would be the front yard, it would be the front, where the property has two front. I understand it's two frontages. I, I, I'm well aware of that. I'm asking you, though, to consider Fourth Avenue. I can't speak to, if, if we choose to have our client testify later, I can't speak to her wishes. I know the application and the preference is for Grand Avenue. That's the application that we've presented. I understand. All right, please proceed. Okay, moving on to your engineer's letter from Insight dated September 29. Uh, I can confirm that the post-development runoff will not exceed the pre-development runoff to adjacent properties. Just giving you a quick uh, plan view of that scenario. Your property line here, again, this is the southern property line where all proposed activities will take place. Uh, the property has a very gentle swale where drainage would be directed really in, in these matters running along the property line into the right of way. In the proposed condition, a portion of that swale would be maintained as is, but then the driveway itself would actually be reverse crowned so that all runoff is contained within the driveway on the subject property and continues really directly east into the right of way so that it in no way impacts the adjacent property. I think that was the, the main bullets, I believe, of, of Insights Letter, but I'd certainly open it up to, to any questions. Let's mark or, that as uh, B2, please. 
The distance from the right of way along 4th Ave to the streetwardmost portion of the property is approximately 23 feet. Draw it over here, 22 feet. That same distance going to the same bump out of the house is, is slightly greater at about 24 feet. If we extend those dimensions, we really don't get that much further until we're complicated by the existing air conditioning units. Around this side of the property, again, we have adequate width between the residence and the property line where that can be pulled further into the property. I mean, your goal is to have off-street parking, correct? That's correct. But, I, but Mr. Chairman, I believe it's also the goal of the applicant to try to comply with the intent and the spirit of the ordinance by shielding the, the, the car, the parked car from the street. So that's why we created this stall that's as far back from the rear of the property, the front of the property as possible. That can't happen on 4th Avenue if you look at the distance that they have on 4th Avenue. Give me a better view is even just it can't happen? Well, it can, uh, I shouldn't say anything can happen, but the point is that it, it's it's not going to be the same design. Of course not. Right. Is the 4th Avenue consideration an absolute no? We have charter stations in Asbury already. And they're not touched. No, they're not. You can leave, just leave and put it right on the street. No problem. Mm -hmm. 
Mr. Chairman, uh, the applicants are willing to consider that option. They they, but they'd have to see what the design looks like because it's it's going to be so different than from what has been uh, proposed. So what they asked is, you know, are there other considerations that you would consider for them to change on this plan to keep the driveway where it is and the, and the charging station where it is, where they could, you know, give in on other areas that would make the board happier with the application, leaving it on grant. Anyone on the board have any other suggestions? The, the difficulty that I'm, that I'm finding is your professional said that you consider the front of the house to be on grand. That's correct. And, and that's where you want to park the car in the front of the house. Well, so when you look at that, uh, where the car is going to be, the stall where the car is parked and, and the gates are closed, there are steps inside there going into the door to the house. That's part of the reason we can't go further back. There's a wing of the house that comes out right there with a the door. Correct. Yes, I can see that. But I, I think that's what the board is trying to say, and I, and I don't speak for any other members, but for me, you're, you're saying that, that that's considered the front of the house towards Grand. Correct. And what we're saying is if you consider fourth and put the driveway in fourth, it's no longer on the, on what you're considering as the front of the house, the front facing part, even though it's a corner lot, we all, we all are aware of that. Um, so I think it, it's difficult to get, for us to get past that, that initial hurdle and give you additional comments when we feel that, that there, there might be a better option on fourth. Notwithstanding that, that, that that option places the parked vehicle closer to the street on fourth Ave. Yeah, the car is going to be, it's not going to be hidden anymore out where the punch. Well, part of the issue we have is the enclosure that you want to design as well. It, it, it seems. Which we're going to. And I think that's where that's we would we offer concessions. The, the whole enclosure concept, uh, I'm just having difficulty with. But we're willing to concede on the, on the fence height, the fence design, if that's what the board wanted. It's just that we thought by, by the, the, the fence that we were proposing was addressing what the ordinance intended to hide the vehicle from the front yard. I think it makes it more of a, a standout by having the enclosure. Yeah, it looks a little bit like a multifamily or commercial sort of dumpster area. So. The, the the car in the in the front of Grand Avenue is an issue for me, and, and the enclosure is an additional issue. Um, I do agree um, with my colleagues that I think Fourth Avenue might be better, um, and and maybe even without an enclosure that looks like sort of hiding a dumpster on a single family property. I don't know that an enclosure is necessary. If we made the concession of, of some modifications to the fence, and these would include reduction in height from six feet to four feet, instead of it being a, a solid board-on-board -board fence with no ability to see through it, we would say remove the boards on one side of the fence so that it's you know four inches of board, four inches of open, four inches of board, et cetera. To comply with the fence ordinance, the current fence ordinance. I, I understand the forfeit uh, ordinance. Uh, I'm still having difficulty with it being in the front yard. So, so as long as, as well as having an electric charging station in the front yard, that also seems uh, hard to accept as well. It would probably look better on the side of the house. On Fourth Avenue, it seems like a better location. I would agree. I think that it really dramatically changes the. Uh, the streetscape, I mean, Grand is a grand avenue, and it seems, this design seems really out of place on that street. Another comment that you had made during your presentation troubles me. You said the way that the driveway is going to be pitched, the runoff is going to be going east. And again, it, it's a, a city where people walk, lot, a lot of pedestrians on Grand Avenue. What... Um, protections will there be to prevent icing, uh, you know, in hazardous uh, situations when it's cold for, for pedestrians walking on Grand? So, so just so I'm understanding, so if, if the applicant was willing to consider moving it, the area to 4th Avenue, the board would uh, 
be amenable to not having any fencing around the area where the car was parked? I think it would look to look better, Mr. McEwen, as opposed to having the fencing. Yeah, I think we'd have to see the design, but it, it would probably sit better with this board that tries to protect the front yard view. So I spoke to the applicants and uh, what they would like is the opportunity to have Mr. Wisolowski prepare a new design showing the driveway on 4th Avenue <coughs> and also come back with maybe a different design with Grand, two designs, and then present it to the board that way. We're amenable to that, Mr. Mm -hmm. McEwen. Okay. I think what would be helpful in, in your design, if you could give us measurements on the charging station, I know you have it on here, but... There's, there's no indication of how tall it is, how large it is. We'll get you the sure. specs for the charging station. Shortly. Is it like the ones that we see around downtown? Is there a good picture? It's, that for, can be it's for a Tesla. I don't think they're as no. big as the one downtown. No, no they're, they're, they're more residential. compact for residential. I would assume. Yeah, yeah I've, I've uh, put a Tesla charging station in one of my properties, and it's actually very small. But your plans do include a photo. I know that's maybe somewhat out of context that we can provide a spec sheet that'll have full specifications, dimensions, and whatnot. We would appreciate that as well. Okay. They're okay. very easy to tuck away so in a corner. Can you tell us what the date would be that we would be available to have us next? Well, I think that would be up to how quickly you guys could get your designs done, right? And then submit them back to... Well, we have to pick a date tonight. How much time do you need to get your... Plans revised again. If, um, if the next meeting is, would it be January 10th? Yes. How much time would you, I'll pitch the question back to you. Yeah, you got the two gentlemen right here, I can tell you. Excuse me. Yes, uh, they're required to be submitted 21 days in advance. It gives us a couple of weeks to make sure we get the reports, to get the reports a week ahead of time to the board and the faculty. And what will be the next meeting after January 10th? January 24th. And there is availability on that date. And we already have a scheduled we have, application. We have one. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, January 24th. 24th. The 24th is. That works for you. That else. And, and as long as it gives you adequate time, Mr. McEwen, to have all those. Reports. Yeah, that, that works. We'll get it in. It's just, I'm going to be way after that, so I want to make sure this gets done before. Understood. Well, I have a technical question. Does your notice have a catch all phrase in it about any and all other variants? Yes. I, have, I don't have the notice with me. Yeah, yeah. Okay, because that may alter your relief that you need to request. Yeah, I have that in. Okay. All right, that's fine. Okay. So, we, so are we all set? We would need a date, time, and place. And Tell the neighbors who are here that that would be the night. All right, so I'll waive. make a motion. I need you to waive any time constraints required for yeah. a decision under the Yeah, the, the, the applicant agrees. Thank Did you. you have something, Mr. Sullivan? Yeah, I just want to make sure that if any of the other considerations that we talked about in terms of the setback for the charger and the landscape requirements and trees, that that's all taken care of in this revision as well. Okay. So it's one, one time. And we'll get you the specifications for the charging station. Right. Okay. All right, so I'll make a motion to carry 1109 Grand Avenue uh, to January 24th, 2023, without further notice. I'll second. Thank you. Um, Daniel Harris? Yes. Jill Potter? Yes. Wendy Glassman? Yes. John Scully? Yes. Jose Alcaraz? Yes. Vice Chair Lewis? Yes. Chairman Avaloni? Yes. Perfect. Okay. Thank Is you. Anyone here in the public that's here on this application that we heard without further notice on the date and time mentioned in the motion? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McEwen. Happy holidays. Yes, happy holidays to all, Mr. and Mrs. Mr. and Mrs. Moss. I guess I'm done. I'm done.
fleeing. You right? are. So I'll make a motion to take a 10 minute recess. I'll second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I will, uh, we will now end the break and I'll take roll call. Um, Daniel Harris. Here. Jill Potter. Here. Wendy Glassman. Here. John Scully. Here. Jose Alcaraz. Here. Russell Lewis. Here. And Christopher Avalone. Here. So next up we have the Breakwater Treatment and Wellness Corps for 807 Memorial Drive, 906 First Avenue. Um, so uh, we have Mr. Mondello uh, so, representing the board. So, so may, may I? Yes, please. So before we call this application, it's my understanding that it has nothing to do with this application, but the board would like some legal advice with respect to some explanations of the land use law in particular, um, it may be inherently beneficial uses, it may be SICA, it may be Medici, all of the above, but it's the attorney and the legal and the professionals that my understanding are going into closed session before this application is called. And that's exactly right, Mr. Mondello. Uh, the board needs some clarification on those issues. So we are asking for a resolution for an executive session. And I believe you have it. I have a copy. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. Thank you, Maria. <laughs> and Matt, although it's wonderful to see you, I would suggest that you have a seat back in the audience. We're not at that juncture where the board is prepared to call your client's application. Is the procedure for me to read this into the I can read it into the record. May I? Yes, please. Thank you. All right, whereas state law permits the exclusion of the public in certain circumstances, and whereas the City of Asbury Park Zoning Board of Adjustment finds that such, such circumstances currently exist and are as, as follows, pending litigation which the City of Asbury Park Zoning Board of Adjustment is a party and matters falling within the attorney-client privilege in order to the extent that confidentiality is required. Whereas the City of Asbury Park Zoning Board of Adjustment will make public minutes of the closed session when confidentiality no longer exists. Now therefore be it resolved by the City of Asbury Park Zoning Board of Adjustment that they are hereby authorized to enter into closed session to discuss pending litigation matters which are exempt from discussion in, in an open public meeting under the Sunshine Law, NJSA, 10 colon 4 6, et cetera. Mr. Chairman, may I? Please. <clears throat> I changed that, amended that, and uh, sent it to the uh, city of Asbury Park. Apparently, it never reached, uh, and that's not the uh, correct resolution. So I would simply ask that I may give, be given permission to amend it. Not that it's pending litigation, and I'm sorry to be repetitive, but it is to give the board some legal advice with respect to the municipal land use law. Uh, it may include inherently beneficial explanations, the SICA explanation, and the Medici explanation. So I apologize. I changed it. I did forward it to the city. Perhaps it didn't get to the right desk. I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Mondello. And I'm sorry for the confusion. Um, we will, again, uh, call for an executive session. I'll make a motion. I'll second. Um, Daniel Harris? Yes. Jill Potter? Yes. Wendy Glassman? Yes. John Scully? Yes. Jose Alcaraz? Yes. Russell Lewis? Yes. Christopher Avalone? Yes. So please bear with us. We will be back. Okay. And um, I will now take roll call. Daniel Harris? Here. Jill Potter? Here. Wendy Glassman? Here. John Scully? Here. Jose Alcaraz? Here. Vice Chair Lewis. Here. And Chairman Avalone. Here. All right, so thank you very much for your patience. I'm sorry for that little delay. Um, we're back to break order treatment at 807 Memorial, 906 First, A uh, First Avenue. Mr. Gilson, is that correct? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Please proceed. Thank you. Good evening, Chairman and members of the board. The application before you tonight is for preliminary and final site plan for an alternative treatment center by Breakwater Treatment and Wellness Corporation under the J. Coning Compassionate Use Medical Cannabis Act. It will be located on Block 403, Lots 2 and 6. The application also technically contains Lot 5 for reasons our engineer will explain, but the business will be on Lots 2 and 6. Thank you. 
The applicant, Breakwater Treatment and Wellness Center, has successfully and without issue operated a similar facility in Cranberry and recently opened a facility in Roselle Park. The applicant seeks the use variance and other ancillary variance re uh, relief related to the use, most of which are existing conditions on the property and they will occupy an existing building that's existed for quite some time. To be clear, this is an alternative treatment center under the J. Coning Compassionate, Compassionate Use Medical Cannabis Act. This is not and is never intended to be a recreational facility authorized under a separate statute known as the CREMA. Uh, at this time, there are no plans to ever convert this facility to recreational and, and such an approval would need to appear before this board. So at this time, I would like to call my first witness, Mr. James Froelich. Uh, of Breakwater. Mr. Mondello, first, uh, do we have jurisdiction to hear this? Uh, we do. Uh, I did review the um, notice of publication and the uh, notices to residents uh, within 200 feet. They certainly are more than adequate. I would simply note for the chair that uh, Mr. Raffetto is here and perhaps he could be recognized. I do believe he has a comment and five minutes later I think he's on his way. Uh, uh, if, uh, we, if Mr. Gilson will allow it, Without we objection. please have Mr. Buffetto give us his comment and then he can leave. Yes. I appreciate that. Please. Good evening, members of the board. <clears throat> Frederick C. Raffetto of the law firm of Hill Wallach. I serve as the municipal attorney for the city of Asbury Park. I'm here this evening to make a statement to place the position of the mayor and city council with regard to the breakwater use variance application on the record. Specifically, the mayor and council object to the use variance application for the following reasons. On January 18, 2010, the New Jersey State Legislature enacted Chapter 307 of the Laws of 2009, known as the New Jersey Compassionate Use Medical Marijuana Act. The act made provision for the New Jersey Department of Health and Senior Services to accept applications from entities for permits to operate as alternative treatment centers in accordance with the act. Thereafter, on July 2nd of 2019, the New Jersey State Legislature enacted Chapter 153 of the Laws of 2019, which comprehensively amended and supplemented the act. Among other things, the 2019 legislation renamed the act as the Jake Honig Compassionate Use Medical Cannabis Act, and it expanded upon all of the regulations relative to the medical use of cannabis in New Jersey. One of the provisions contained in the 2019 legislation requires that any applicant seeking a permit to operate as a medical cannabis cultivator, medical cannabis manufacturer, or medical cannabis dispensary must include as part of its application proof that the proposed location will conform to municipal zoning requirements allowing for such activities, along with the submission of proof of local support for the suitability of the location. Use of any property within the city of Asbury Park as the site of a medical cannabis alternative treatment center has never been permitted in any of the regular zoning districts of the city, nor under any of the redevelopment plans which govern the various redevelopment areas within the city. Following the New Jersey State Legislature's adoption of the initial act and the 2019 amending legislation, the mayor and city council of Asbury Park did not amend the city's zoning regulations or any of its redevelopment plans to allow medical cannabis alternative treatment centers to operate anywhere within the city. This was a conscious and knowing determination by the mayor and city council in that the governing body did not believe that this represented an appropriate land use to be permitted within the city. Before taking any action to consider permitting any type of medical cannabis facility to locate within the city, the mayor and council believed it would be necessary to undertake further studies to determine whether and where such uses may be desirable and feasible, including the receipt of guidance from the municipal planner and the planning board. None of these activities has occurred as of yet. Importantly, the Mayor and City Council are well aware of the long-standing provision contained within the City's existing zoning ordinances at Section 30-15, which defines the term prohibited use to mean a use or use classification which is not expressly permitted in a zone district. Since medical cannabis alternative treatment centers are not expressly permitted in any of the regular zoning districts, nor in any of the redevelopment areas of the City, they are necessarily a prohibited use in the city of Asbury Park. 
Given the language of the city's zoning ordinance, there was no need for the city to expressly prohibit medical cannabis alternative treatment centers at that time. By virtue of the fact that medical cannabis alternative treatment centers were not permitted, they were automatically prohibited. More recently, the New Jersey State Legislature enacted Chapter 16 of the Laws of 2021, known as the New Jersey Cannabis Regulatory Enforcement Assistance and Marketplace Modernization Act, known as CREMA, which relates to adult use, also known as recreational cannabis. CREMA established six separate classes of recreational cannabis licenses, including cannabis cultivator, cannabis manufacturer, cannabis wholesaler, cannabis distributor, cannabis retailer, and cannabis delivery service. Pursuant to CREMA, municipalities in the state of New Jersey were afforded a period of 180 days following the enaction of the law to either opt in or opt out of permitting recreational cannabis establishments within their municipal boundaries. By contrast to the medical cannabis statutes, CREMA actually required municipalities to take affirmative action to opt out if they wish to prohibit recreational cannabis operations within their jurisdictions. Importantly, if a municipality failed to act within that 180 day period, then its failure would be deemed to permit the location and operation of recreational cannabis establishments within the municipality in accordance with the act. On July 14th, 2021, the Asbury Park Mayor and Council timely opted out of all classes of recreational cannabis through the adoption of Ordinance 2021-25. The city's opt-out ordinance prohibited the operation of all classes of recreational cannabis businesses within Asbury Park, with the exception of cannabis deliveries, which must be allowed by statute and amended the land development regulations of the city, as well as all existing redevelopment plans accordingly. The city's legislative intent to prohibit all classes of recreational cannabis from locating within the geographic boundaries of the city was clear in the opt-out ordinance. The adoption of the opt-out ordinance regarding recreational cannabis, along with the city council's conscious decision not to take any official legislative action to permit medical cannabis alternative treatment centers to locate within the city, evidenced the council's clear legislative intent to prohibit all types of cannabis establishments, whether medical or recreational. On August 10th of 2022, the mayor and city council adopted resolution number 2022-360, which confirmed this determination <coughs> and which clarified the city council's legislative intent regarding the prohibition of medical cannabis alternative treatment centers within the city. The mayor and city council as the city's governing body possesses the exclusive power to establish the land use character of the municipality through the adoption of zoning ordinances pursuant to the municipal land use law. In fact, the power to zone land rests squarely within the exclusive province of the governing body. In view of the city council's clear legislative intent to prohibit all types of cannabis establishments, whether medical or recreational, the mayor and city council strongly oppose the use variance currently being sought by the applicant in this matter. Finally, and for the record, the mayor and city council submit that the granting of a use variance in this matter would undermine the powers of the governing body and would constitute an impermissible usurpation of the council's authority to zone. Thank you for allowing me to make this statement and to place the position of the mayor and city council on the record in this matter. Thank you, Mr. Raffetto. All right, Mr. Gilson, please proceed. Yes, at this time, with the permission of the board, I'd like to call my first witness, Mr. James Froelich uh, from Bridgeport. Good evening, sir. If you could raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm a testimony about to give me the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you God? I do. Please put your hand down, state your name, spell your last name, and give us your address. Sure. Uh, is that business address, personal address? Business. Sure. Uh, it's James Froelich, F-R-O-E-H-L-I-C-H. The address is 2 Corporate Drive, Suite E, Cranberry, New Jersey, 808512. Your witness, Mr. Gilson. Wait, one second, Mr. Mondello. Mondello. Would okay. you please swear in um, our <coughs> professionals so that uh, they can be ready for any questions they may have? Gentlemen, raise your right hand. Do you swear from a testimony about to give the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth shall be God? Yes. Okay. Put your hand down. Please state your name, spell your last name, and give us your business address. Michael Sullivan, Clark Caden Hintz, Ward Planner, 100 Barrack Street, Trenton. Jason Fitchner, Inside Engineering, 
Board Engineer, 1955 Route 34 in Wall. Thank you. Please proceed, Mr. Froelich, Mr. Gilson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Froelich, could you please describe your affiliation with uh, Breakwater Treatment and Wellness Corporation? Sure. I am the Chief of Staff for Breakwater Treatment and Wellness, and I've held that position for approximately the last five years. Can you explain your experience in the field of alternative treatment centers and Breakwater's experience? Sure. So we've been operating since approximately October 2015, um, serving exclusively medical patients out of our Cranberry, New Jersey facility. Um, again, it's so we are a vertically integrated. We're one of the original six alternative treatment centers. So vertically integrated, what that means within the industry is that we do everything ourselves, right? So we grow all of the plants, process all of the plants, package them, as well as dispense them. Up until September of this year, we were in the one location in Cranberry, New Jersey. It's 8A off the turnpike. Um, and uh, we recently just opened in Roselle Park a satellite dispensary, which would be a more similar use to what we're proposing here in that it is a dispensary only. The cultivation, manufacturing, processing, and packaging is, is something that would still occur in our Cranberry, New Jersey location. And could you describe the hours of operation which you would intend this dispensary in Asbury Park to operate? So, yeah, I believe the application would be uh, 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. is the, what we had there. Um, and, you know, our, our other satellite location, we started with five days a week. We've recently expanded to seven days a week. That's just kind of ramping up to um, patient needs and addressing those as they come up um, with volume. And can you describe the number of employees you would have on site and shift breakdown? Sure. So at, at one given time, you're talking usually between five to, to nine employees approximately 15 for the day if it's broken down to the shifts, but a couple of those could be people who are uh, transporting. Um, so in between our main location, uh, that is transported from there in a patient ready packaging to there. So some of those would be people who are transporting as well as occasionally a manager or um, someone from our headquarters just uh, looking to stopping in and checking out the facility. So generally we'd be looking at seven or eight people at a time as far as employees. And could you describe the typical time and typical frequency of deliveries to your facility? Sure. Uh, so first, you know, having a, a satellite facility is new to us, but generally we're looking at one to three times a week is the delivery. So something that's not particularly frequent. And as far as a delivery, we're talking a Mercedes Sprinter. So you're not talking box trucks. You're not tra talking tractor trailers. It's um, unmarked. Um, sprinter vans and like I said that's usually between one and three times a week depending on patient needs and restocking of the different types of medicine that we have. Is Roselle Park currently in operation? It is yes we opened for, for business in September. So you wouldn't know what deliveries are going on there? No we're, we're doing between one and three a week approximately for, for supplying based on that it just depends on sales so if there's higher sales one week it might be more but generally we're looking between one and three deliveries per week. You are delivering to patients also, correct? Uh, I'm sorry? Are you delivering to patients? No, we're not currently offering delivery. Um, that's something we, we've looked at in the future, in the future, but it's a lot to tackle um, in terms of regulations with the state, so it's not something that we're currently offering, though it is something we would like to in the future. Okay. Could you just describe the average time that a patient spends at the facility? Sure. So, so it can vary depending on the patient. If they've been to us before, there's some patients who've been coming to us for over seven years at this point. Um, so those patients, a lot of times, unless there's a new product offering, they know what they want. We also offer online ordering. So it's generally going to be well under 10 minutes as quickly as two to four minutes. Um, now, we do also offer for patients who are new to medical cannabis. We offer consultations. So that that patient could be uh, 20 to 30 minutes. Um, that's generally more rare. We do also offer Zoom consultations and phone consultations for patients who may not want to be in the facility but want some more um, instruction on how they could use that cannabis medicine. It's unfamiliar to a lot of people, so kind of getting them used to that and trying to make sure they get the best results that they could. Is out of this medicine. strictly CBD or is it CBD? No, no, we, we do a full spectrum of products, but most of our products do include THC as well. This is... Um, Cannabis, as, as most people are, are aware of it, not just CBD. And have you had issues with, or would you anticipate any queuing of customers outside? Um, in our Cranberry location, there is some, but we have sufficient parking and we're able, we have a, a significant number of registers. When um, you know we've had high level, we can work it down to an average of one patient per minute. So we really don't see much queuing and we, you know, we, 
we have people directing traffic if that is the case, but we generally, we don't see that. Our wait times are under five minutes at this point now. Um, patients really aren't waiting, so it's not something that, that we are seeing at all at this point. And all patients need a prescription from a doctor. That's correct, yeah. Uh, I believe um, licensed nurses and a couple of and PAs can prescribe now as well, but yes, they would need a valid, it's technically not a prescription, it's a recommendation, but that goes through the state. It's verified that they have prescribing um, permission um, in terms of they don't have any issues with over-prescribing. And then, yeah, they would have a valid prescription and the, uh, the physician or PA can write that for up to one year. And what at each location are you seeing as an average of customers per day? And would you anticipate that to be similar in Asbury Park? Sure. So for our new satellite dispensary that we opened in Roselle Park, we're seeing between 50 to 100 patients per day. Um, our Cranberry location, as I said, we've been open for seven years there, so there's a bit more traffic. But you're talking 200 to 250 patients spread out over a, a 10 to 11 <coughs> hour day. So you're not talking about a tremendous amount at a time. And as I said, most of those patients, their transaction time is under five minutes. So you're not seeing a lot of crowding, even at our Cranberry facility where we are seeing significantly more. But we would anticipate as a new location, much more similar to the Roselle Park location, where you're talking 50 to 100 patients per day on average. In yeah. either of those locations, what's the geographic distribution of your customers? Sure. So um, that's one of the reasons we really do want to expand access. We have a lot of people who drive well over an hour to see us, um, sometimes a couple hours. Uh, and you know, I think that speaks to just the quality of our product, the care we put into that product. Um, so we do have people who are local to us, but we, we do see people driving hours to see us. We have a, a number of patients in Monmouth County, and that's why we, we are interested in expanding access for those patients. A lot of patients, it's very difficult for them to sit in a car for that period of time, and that's why we want to provide some better access for them. And can you describe the security at your other locations and the security which you would have in Esbury Park? Sure. So a lot of that security is mandated by state laws or regulations. So um, as far as where the product is kept when we are not there, that is a DA, DEA compliant vault, usually welded wire or reinforced concrete. Um, we also have security cameras. We go above and beyond what the state requires, but basically every angle in the building is covered by security cameras. We have those backed up 30, over 30 days and the state has access, live access to all of those cameras and we retain that in case there's anything that they would ever wanna see. A number of alarms, panic buttons, a Roselle Park location also has armed security that is on the basis of the ordinance in Roselle Park. Um, they required that we had armed security on premises. We do not have that in our Cranberry location. Um, we've been operating for seven years and you know that's just how we felt patients would be most comfortable in that situation. But as I said, in Roselle Park, it is required in the ordinance that you have armed security. So we comply with that requirement. If you came to Asbury Park, would you have armed security? Um, that's not something we've necessarily determined. We would certainly have guards, but it's something we'd be willing to work with if the city feels more comfortable with armed security. That was the case in Roselle Park. We also worked with the police department closely there. We worked closely with the police department in Cranberry as well. Um, we had the chief of police come and inspect our facility multiple times as we were building it out to give security recommendations. We really want everyone to feel comfortable with what we're doing and feel comfortable that it's not a security threat. We also want our, our, you know, our employees to feel safe as well. So. That's something that we haven't determined, but would hope that if we were to move forward, that could be a conversation and we can come to a conclusion that's going to make everyone feel comfortable about that. And if in your approximately seven years of business, have you had any serious security issues? None that whatsoever. Related to these problems? Thank you. That's all uh, the testimony for this witness. I offer it to the board and their experts for any questions they may have. Uh, anybody on the board have any questions for Mr. Prolick? Why Asbury Park? Yeah, so um, we love it as a location. It, look, it's a, it's a city that has a tremendous amount of history, culture, music, beaches, restaurants. It's also access too. As I said, we have a number of patients who come from Monmouth County. It's located not far off the parkway mm -hmm. and has good access from the north and south for patients who may be on the shore. We have a lot of patients who drive a significant distance to get to us. Um, so from a location, we love it and we, we are a local family-owned company and we feel that kind of resonates a lot with the community in Asbury Park where there is a strong local community and local businesses, local restaurants, local stores. Um, we're only in New Jersey. We only intend to ever be in New Jersey. And um, yeah, it, it's a community we would love to be a part of. And, uh, yeah. 
Have you been looking at other municipalities and towns in Monmouth County? Uh, we have not. We've we've had site control on this location for quite some time, and the, the application has been submitted with the board. Uh, obviously, through 2020, a lot happened and things got delayed. Um, you know, it kind of goes also to our, our business practices. Right? Is um, we we want to look at slow controlled growth and making sure we're doing the right things. Um, so we've taken our time in selecting this location. This location in particular, a uh, big deal for us was making sure we had sufficient parking. Um, it's a great location for that. We don't want to contribute to any sort of parking issues in Asbury Park. Um, it has great access. Some of our patients are mobility impaired. Having that large parking lot um, with multiple parking, that's not going to require them to walk a long distance as well as sufficient space so that people can have a comfortable experience. We can have sufficient registers so that we don't have queuing. Um, so we, we really chose this location carefully. Also, you know, it's reviewing the drug-free school zone map in Asbury. It's a, it's, there's not many places that, you know, it's a small city geographically, so there's not many places. So this was a location we really, really took a lot of time finding. So we, um, we had previously applied in Red Bank a very long time ago. Um, but Asbury is really where we would like to be, and um, we haven't been looking at other locations. This is really a location that we think would be ideal um, for servicing patients and somewhere we would want to grow and contribute to the community as well. Without violating HIPAA laws, could you give us a breakdown of your patients? In terms of demographics? or yeah, not, not yeah. I mean, most people use medical marijuana as they don't want to take op opiates or, you know, which sure. are prescribed by doctors, okay? Um, and they have a, a, a large amount of needs, people glaucoma, you know, things like that. That's what I want to hear. Like, you know, basically what type of patients? Sure, so it, it's really varied. Um, so when the program started, it was a very limited program, talking back to 2011 or so, where, um, you know, it was a lot of terminal diagnosis. Over time, it's been expanded pretty significantly. Most notably in 2018 with Murphy expanding and got chronic pain and anxiety going to your point about opioids and opiates. Um, chronic pain was really big um, in terms of allowing people to switch off or reduce their reliance on this medication. But there's, there's a number of conditions, ALS, um, cancer, uh, AIDS, there's a lot of patients and it's really varied at this point. Um, initially it was a much older population but we are seeing a, a much broader spectrum of patients at this time but you know it, it does run the gamut from anxiety patients to people with terminal diagnosis as well and we see really a very broad spectrum of patients do you draw a lot of veterans uh, we do we have a tremendous amount of veterans and to that point all veterans receive a uh, discount on every purchase over 50 percent of our patients re receive a discount on every single purchase that includes veterans anyone on government assistance, seniors, and we also give a 40% discount to any minors as well for those who might be suffering from childhood cancer, any of those things as well. So as I said, uh, we make sure that we give them discounts on, on all of those purchases. Okay, and the amount that people can purchase I'm sorry? Mounted, you can put that, That's determined by their physician. Um, so it could be anywhere from as small as one eighth per month up to three ounces. If someone has a terminal diagnosis, they have an unlimited purchasing ability. Um, and that, but that's up to their physician. So how, how it basically works is someone would come into our facility, they present us with their medical ID, and then we can pull them up on the state site and we see a live view of their prescription. So basically, and they complete a purchase, we enter it in, and that is updated in real time. So someone couldn't go to us and then go to another place and purchase over. When their purchase is completed, that is update in real time to make sure that it's up to date on their prescription. They can't um, you know, go to one place, go to another, and have that prescription not be updated. It is updated as soon as they complete that purchase. Okay, let's talk about recovering junkies. Oh, I need a better word than that, my bad. Um, but, <laughs> sure. <okay. laughs> um, People with substance abuse issues. Yeah, substance abuse patients, okay, who might try and be weaning off of heroin, sure. cocaine, okay, do you entertain them also? Yeah, so uh, opioid use disorder is, uh, I believe, you know, one of the conditions that they're looking at adding. Um, a lot of people have had tremendous success in either weaning off of, um, reducing the amount of opiates or opioids, or completely eliminating them. Um, from a quality of life, from a safety perspective, you're, you're, you're talking about a tremendous benefit um, where, you know, there's still, 
even legally obtained opioids not targeting heroin, there is still a risk of overdose. There's definitely a risk of dependency. Um, and there's a quality of life issue with that. And what we see with our patients is that they do have a significant improvement of quality of life in either adding or completely replacing with cannabis over those opioids or opiates. Okay, many people drink alcohol to kill pain. Sure. Okay, please compare cannabis to alcohol and allevi allevi alleviation of pain. So it, science is still developing on this um, because for a very long time, cannabis has been illegal. So it's been very difficult to get quality research on that. Um, but from a harm reduction standpoint, talking alcohol to cannabis, you're talking about worlds of difference. Um, you know, I don't think you're qualified really to make those comparisons, are you, Mr. Froelich? I, just talking from our experience in terms of risk of there's no risk. But you're risk not of, a doctor, nor I, are you. <laughs> I'm certainly not a doctor. Just talking in terms of possibility of physical overdose or physical addiction, that's based. I, I, but I don't want to mislead the board that, you know, that that's not data that you can provide. Certainly, yeah. So, uh, yes, in terms of, I would say that danger to society and danger to people's health, that cannabis is less and you can talk harm reduction, but yes, I cannot provide you with an exact scientific study. And no, I am not a doctor. Thank you. I have a question. Um, first of all, in response to the descriptions that you gave to Mr. Harris, uh, uh, the conditions sure. for which your patients come, and also in your response to uh, Mr. Lewis about why you chose Asbury Park, what is the correlation or what is the basis for saying a community that's steeped in arts and culture and restaurants, um, what does that have to do with the provision of medical marijuana? Sure. It, we want to operate in a community that we feel part of. That's something that we've we found in Roselle Park as well. We sponsored their arts festival. We want to be a part of the community. We want to contribute to community events and that, that this is a community that we feel has that sort of feel that we would want to be involved in. Um, so, you know, other things we've done in Roselle Park at that arts festival, we also are sponsoring expungements for people. So people who have cannabis convictions, we've sponsored an attorney who is going to be providing free of charge expungements for people who have cannabis convictions and are eligible. So to that end, it's we want to be a part of a community. And certainly restaurants, are none of those things have to deal with the provision of medical cannabis, but we do want to be a part of a community and this is a community that we find very appealing. <coughs> so you help with expungement of people's records? Yes, yes. So that's something we, we recently released. We had the attorney at the uh, arts festival, but it's also a thing where we have a QR code. We rolled it out for our employees, which is something that we're really focused on doing as well as hiring locally, hiring people with prior convictions. Um, you know, unfortunately, we're constrained somewhat by law as to who we can hire in terms of convictions. But it's something we're really passionate about helping people out, getting those free convictions for those that weren't done automatically through the expungement law. Thank you. Any further questions from the board from Mr. Froelich? Your lawyer um, mentioned in his opening statements that um, recreational mm -hmm. marijuana is not something that is, I believe he said, ever going to be I, I, offered at this location or your other locations. Is that not part of, is the word ever, never in your business plan? So I think what he said at this time, and more specifically, it's not something we would be able to do without city council taking further action. We. This isn't, we can't so throw- you're qualifying that statement now mm -hmm. and saying that if the council changed. Well, I believe he qualified the statement as well, but what I'm saying is that that is not something we would be able to, to do without a change on the city council. They would have to explicitly um, allow for that use and then we would have to apply through the state. It is not something we would be able to do without explicit action from the council. It's, we can't, there's no Trojan horse here. We can't sneak that in. It is something that would have to be consciously done on the council level to create that ordinance to allow us to do it. But if you had the ability, right. that would be something that you would be... So, yeah, the we haven't even applied in, in our other locations. Our focus is on patients now. As I said, we are taking a slow approach. We've been open to our patients. They've relied on us for seven years. Um, if you look historically at some markets, however, when... 
uh, medical cannabis goes adult use or recreational, whichever you prefer to call it. A lot of times some patients drop out of it. So it, it becomes, these are people who are using cannabis medically, um, but they end up not continuing to get the card. So sometimes those medical cannabis programs become so small as to be unsustainable. That said, we, we always have our focus on patients and people who are using it medically and we intend to treat it that way for people who are coming to our location, regardless of if it ever went to adult use or recreational. You mentioned that <clears throat> you have several patients from Monmouth County that drive to your other facilities. Mm -hmm. And is that because they like your product or is there no other facilities in the area that they could go to? Yeah, it's specifically for our product. Um, there, there's several. There's in Neptune and Eatontown, there, there's a location, and we still get a significant number of people from Monmouth County coming to our facility. What's different about your product? From in my opinion, <laughs> it's, 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 the, it's the care we put into it. Um, so we 100% hand trim. Uh, to, now, without going too too far into depth on this, what that means is but, we, but we have nothing to base that on, Ms. Mr. Fro. Like you can say your product is di different than this other person's, but we don't know that for a fact. So uh, we can accept what you're saying, but <laughs> sure. how, do, how do we well, know what that, what that it, means? If you'd like, what I was going to do is explain some of the difference between our product and other people's. But um, there are so many cannabis people now. Uh, you're saying that you know everyone's different type of cannabis manufacturer and production and. We, we have a pretty good idea of what's in the market. And yes, we, I, the, it, the fact that people come to us and pass many other dispensaries, I think speaks to that fact. Um, where, you know, we are a local brand who truly cares about what we're doing with the cannabis. And that's why we're looking to provide better access for the patients. So, you know, I can't speak to every single thing, but I can tell you that what patients tell us and why they tell us they're coming to us, why they're driving past other facilities, is that there is the amount of care we put into that and making sure we're providing quality medicine for those patients. Mr. Froelich, if I will, to make it simple for the board, would you compare it to almost getting a craft beer rather than a Budweiser? I, I'd hesitate to do an, an alcohol <laughs> comparison, but yes, we, we, we spend a lot of time. We really work quite hard at it. Uh, the hand trimming aspect of it is making sure you're preserving the integrity of the medicine and, and we really take the time and effort to make sure that it's something quality that's going to help people. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, is your preference to open to the public for questions every witness? Or? First our board professionals and then the public. <coughs> Go ahead. Uh, Mr. Froelich, thank sure. you. That was very helpful. Appreciate your testimony. I, and I just want to drill down on this. So, People are driving hours to your dispensary to get your products because you feel they're unique, correct? Correct. All right, okay. Those same folks could go anywhere. They could go to a adult dispensary and get product. They could go to a medicinal place to get product. Correct. Okay. How many patients drive hours to get this unique product? So, um, roughly, is yeah, it I five, mean, 10, 100? Hundreds. Hundreds, you're hundreds. saying? Uh, hundreds over the course of, of a month. drive month. hours because your product is so unique. Correct. Okay, interesting. Um, Ascend, Harmony, TerraSend, Rise, they all got their medicinal licenses so that they could be first in line to go to adult use so they could make five, four to five times the amount of revenue. You are an anomaly, and I say that in a positive light, but please explain to me you have no current plans to expand to adult use, and you would need a resolution from the governing body to expand to adult use. But forgive me, I'm just having a hard time wrapping my arms around a business that doesn't want to make five times the amount of money. Yeah, um, it's a question, but um, yes, yeah, sustainable growth, right? Um, we're not looking to maximize our revenue and sell to a large multi-state organization. We're not looking to be publicly traded. We want to build a real company that's part of the community and part of the state of New Jersey. Um, doing that and making sure we're staying by the people who've been coming to us and spending money with us for seven years, that doesn't happen by pushing forward and making sure you're maximizing revenue this year. We want to build something real that's going to be here for a long time. And we want to focus on the patients who built that business for us. And that's why none of our locations, we have not submitted applications for adult use at any of them. And it, we're not in a rush to do that. It's certainly exciting on a business opportunity. But as I said, we're not looking to build, blow everything up now. We want to build something real and sustainable. And that doesn't happen quickly. 
Thank you for that. And you certainly couldn't make a represent representation to the board that we're never going into adult use cannabis. No, uh, it, it may yeah. not be sustainable as a business. As I said, a lot of times medical markets are decimated by adult use people. And it depends on the state. The state of New Jersey has done some great things. It lowered the price of cards. Um, but it may not be sustainable as a business to remain in medical forever. Um, but then again, our focus would still be on those patients. And if you did, certainly the number of uh, customers now, we would call them, would increase drastically. Sure, yeah. And, right. and the current site that you're choosing may not be any longer able to sustain that amount of people, correct? Um, I, I would disagree with that conclusion. Based on the space, we have almost 7,000 square feet. We're currently operating our dispensary. But you don't know that. I, I, I suppose, but uh, looking at what we're currently operating and what we're able to see when we've seen our most busy times, I would be hard pressed to believe that in a space that is three times that size would have almost three times the registers possible and approximately three times the parking space, we would be able to handle that sort of volume. Do you have referrals from doctors? Do we? Um, nothing. There's no business relationship for that, but certainly a number of physicians refer patients to us. Yes. For me. Thank you. Uh, no further, further questions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Sullivan. Do you have a... Um, so um, you talk about how unique your products are? Sure. Do you have a list of them? Uh, they on me? Or? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, our, our website is publicly accessible, and that, that'll show you all of our products on there. So, and, okay. And yeah, if, so basically, we, you could break it down into a few categories, right? So we have our, our flower, which is what most people are familiar with when they think of cannabis, right? It's the, the bud. Um, then we also have extracted products. We have vaporizer cartridges. We have an MCT oil, which is basically a sublingual or topical product where um, that's something that a lot of patients who may be new to cannabis are more comfortable because it's, it's dosable, right? It's an oil that they can put under their tongue with gradations on there so they can say, titrate their dose and know exactly what they're taking. That's not something that's necessarily easy with the standard uh, flower. Uh, we also have lozenges and Anything else I'm forgetting there? Oh, yeah, so we, we also have concentrates um, that are solventless. So without going too deep into the cannabis nerdery, so there's concentrates that are normal concentrates for vaporizers and MCT are made with an ethanol-based extraction, which is then distilled off, and you get the pure cannabis oil, which is either diluted in the MCT or added to the cartridges. We've recently started um, a solventless program, which is basically extracting the cannabinoids using only ice, water, and agitation, and drying afterwards. And that's a more um, concentrated product. Some patients need those higher doses, and it allows them to do that without having to smoke as much. But yeah, we, we do have a full range of products and looking to releasing more uh, potential edible forms. No formulas. edibles? Uh, the only one we have, we have mint lozenges um, currently, but we are looking at releasing you know, soft lozenges, which is gummies, as they're called in New Jersey in the future. Uh, edibles are fairly limited in the program currently, um, so you know, we look forward to adapting that. Yeah, I normally didn't consider a lozenge an edible, but okay. <laughs> it's, you, know, it, you eat it. Um, so yeah, and that, that's another thing, it's absorbed sublingually, so that's something that's nice for patients when they're more comfortable, they're more used to a pill, right? You can break that in half, you can titrate that dose and make sure you're getting reliable, consistent effects for whatever condition they are treating. I, I want to know who the creative genius is who comes up with the names. Blue uh, and Cream, Rainbow Driver, Grape Ape. <laughs> so those are, all, <laughs> those are all breeders. Um, we use their names. Um, we, we purchase <laughs> seeds and do all sorts of pheno hunts to find strains that work for us for mass production. So, 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 uh, so knowing... Seeing the names, sure. um, those names are not unique to your business. No, no. So those are not in-house bred. Those, so we purchase seeds from, from breeders um, based on what we're trying to find in terms of effects for patients to round out our portfolio. Um, we then germinate a number of those seeds, select those down to a specific plant, sometimes out of hundreds of seeds, and um, we select one, and then that is propagated through cloning. So each one in production is an exact genetic clone of one mother plant that we keep on site. So we don't grow our production strains from seed, we grow those all through propagation. So, so you, as well as other um, cultivators, mm -hmm. are using the same strains? It's a little, so I would, 
again, without going too deep into the cannabis nerdery. So you, you look at seeds, right? Um, the same way you could look at children, right? They, they could have the same genetics, right? One company could buy um, the exact same seeds and it's just luck of the draw as how those genetics express themselves when you grow it. When you find a plant that expresses those genetics in a way that's favorable in terms of cannabinoids, terpenes, affects all of those things, we then select that plant for further production. Also, you know, how vigorous is the plant? What type of yields does it have? So you could have the same genetics and have a completely different plant um, because they're expressed differently. So do you change the name? Do you create a new cultivar if you've actually modified the performance of these plants? So no, it, we would still use that same genetics. Um, if you had multiple phenotypes of that plant, you would just use a number to indicate that based on the, the selection process. If you decided tomorrow to uh, go into the adult use world, mm -hmm. what would change about your products that you have? Uh, in our, our hopes and estimations, nothing. We, we want to continue to do the same thing and that's why we haven't rushed to it is we don't want to compromise on the quality. We want to make sure that we're scaled to a point where nothing is going to change for the patients who've been coming to us for seven years. It's just a different, different sales thing. Different, different sales. Different and pricing and different. Potentially, it, you know, it, it's not in the near future so we haven't worked all that out. But yeah, we, we would want, if that conversion ever happened, we'd want it nothing to change for our patients in terms of what they come in and experience in the store. As far as um, disposal of any, mm -hmm. uh, what's the shelf life of your product? So most, the, the standard shelf life in New Jersey is six months um, in, it, in its package, but, and we've switched to um, third party testing now. Previously the state was doing all of the testing, now it's private third party labs. Um, so they continue to do stability and as they progress past that six months that was input as the default, they'll be allowed to extend past that. What happens if you have uh, products that uh, expire? Sure. Um, so sort of the cell bite. anything, any medicine that needs to be thrown out or destroyed is done in a controlled destruction in front of the state. So our field monitor comes to the facility. And so to be clear, the Asbury Park facility, none of that would occur there. The, the garbage that would be there is strictly, you know, employee lunches, some light paperweights, those types of things. Anything that's active product would... Um, would have to be brought back to Cranberry on a manifest, all logged with the state, and then destroyed in front of our field monitor. So the state would know every tag, uh, every product that was destroyed. E exactly, say someone comes back and they have a faulty cartridge or something and they want to return it, we would need to take that, tag it, and it would be placed into the vault until we did a controlled destruction with the state. So none of that active product is just being thrown into a dumpster. Do you guarantee uh, if you have a faulty cartridge, you get to bring it back and get it replaced? <laughs> G generally, yeah. I mean, if it's completely empty, that, that might be, a, that's like eating the whole steak and sending it back, right? Um, but yeah, we, we really do try to make sure that we have a good experience for all of our patients. Do you have a, 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 any kind of medical professional on site? When you said you do consultation, who's doing these consultations? Sure. So those are our dispensary staff. We don't have medical uh, staff on site. And a lot of that is just walking Look, unfortunately, as I said, there, there hasn't been enough research done at this point. So a lot of it is going to, and cannabis affects everyone differently. Um, so what works for one person for a certain um, symptom that you're having may not work for another. So this is largely walking them through administration methods. Someone may have never smoked, someone may have never used a vaporizer, more administration methods. And then, you know, anything interactions, all of that, we tell, refer, ask your physician about that. That's not something we're qualified. It's more use of the medicine and what might be possible effects that you're getting, what symptom relief you might be getting from that strain. But again, everyone can react to cannabis differently and different strains differently. So just to follow up. Sure. So in other words, your uh -huh. AK-47, uh -huh. um, it's helpful for pain, nausea, spasms, headaches, eye pressure, and cramping. That's fairly speculative. Yeah, it's, it's, it's anecdotal based, but we've seen thousands and thousands of patients who talk to us about what this was helpful for as well. Um, so, you know, there hasn't been enough research for us to say it does this, and we wouldn't ever say it does this. Other patients have found that it is helpful for X, Y, and Z, um, and we can recommend based on that. Or if someone's, you know, having trouble sleep, we would steer them away from certain strains with certain types of terpenes because that's probably going to make you more energized, those type of things. So again, it's, it's more about guiding them on administration and possible symptom relief that they could uh, receive from each of So you people. have, um, so who provides, so how do you, how do you get that information? How, did, how, how does the, the, the sure. person who comes to work for you, who's going to work behind the counter and say, 
Oh, what, what are your symptoms? Oh, oh, here's what I'm experiencing. Oh, this is the right stuff. How did they know? Sure. So again, it's we speculative, and there's no research. And do you have yeah. data? Do you collect that? We do. We do. Especially when we release a new strain, for instance, we'll send out everyone who purchased that strain, and we'll ask them, "What did it work for? You know, was it helpful for this? Did you find what symptoms?" So we were continuing to collect more and more data on that, and. It's continued conversations with people and we have meetings and continued trainings on all of those things. But again, it's, you know, it's anecdotal, but on a large enough scale, it becomes slightly better than anecdotal and people report and come back and, you know, we can, we have records of everything they purchased. So we know if they say that, that thing I had last time, I didn't really like that X, Y, and Z happened. Do you have something that you would recommend? We could try and steer them to something that might be, or this worked really well for me. Do you have something that's similar? And we could recommend things that are similar and, likely to have similar symptom relief. Okay, you show your THC levels on all your car on all your products, I'm, right? I'm sorry? Show your THC levels on all your products. Yeah, yeah, so we have full third party uh, lab testing and any patient who wants the full COA, which has everything on it, you know, all the safety tests, microbials, heavy metals, as well as full cannabinoid panels and full terpene panels. We have those on request. We also list the top five cannabinoids and top five terpenes on each product as well. Okay, let's explain, let's, let's go into. I, I can't hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, I've cracked my tooth here. <laughs> um, let's explain how your, how your product compares to stuff that people can buy on the street. Sure. You still have competition. Um, so, uh, you know, that, that's, a, that's a broad swath of things, right? But what, what, what I can say is that all of our products are third party tested for all sorts of things in terms of heavy metals, microbials, um, mold spores, fungal spores, all of those things. So, um, look, there, I'm sure there's out on the street, there's a, a broad spectrum of products in terms of safety profile and quality, right? Um, but what you do get when you come to us is we know that. Each, each batch has been batch tested for safety and potency. Um, really important in particular for edibles and those types of things. Um, what you're seeing when they are testing things off the street is wild variation in terms of potency, um, which can lead, you know, lead to some unintended effects when people are taking something like that, that you don't really know what the potency is. So all of our products are tested to ensure that the potency and you're getting what you're expecting to get out of that. No, the reason I ask is because a large amount of street, street grass right now has fentanyl in it. And I mean, I want to know what, what extremes you go to to protect your customers. As far as fentanyl? No, I know you don't have fentanyl. Yeah, I know. I'm saying, you know. <laughs> 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 I'm just using that as an example. Sure, yeah. I mean, look, as I said, it, that's one of the reasons people feel more comfortable coming to us, right, is that they know that it's been tested. They know that we're regulated. I mean, they know that we're a state-inspected facility. So that's one of the things that makes people feel more comfortable about using it as a medicine. Okay. You mentioned that several times that there's no, there's a lack of research. Sure. And, and with regards to the effects and, and what symptoms it treats, has your company sponsored any research or are, do you contribute to any research? That's not something we've been able to do yet. That's just beginning because it's been such a regulated compound that there isn't research available. Um, so, you know, it's something we're interested in, but it's not an opportunity that has presented itself at this time. But it's certainly something we are interested in. Very quickly, Mr. Chairman, I know yeah. you're not a, phys a physician, Mr. Frolic, but uh, I did speak to my optometrist, and I'm just curious if you would agree with uh, the statement she made to me. There is a history of glycoma in my family, and I had asked her about glycoma and using cannabis, and she responded, that would be the last uh, thing that we would ever prescribe because number one, you'd have to smoke it every day, multiple times. She said there's many more effective drugs for glycoma versus cannabis. Would you, just based on experience, you're not a physician, but would you agree <laughs> I, agree with that? Yeah. I, 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 I don't have enough information about other therapeutic options to make that conclusion. I know that some people find tremendous relief from it. So You've I, had some patients that have glycoma that use it and they've said to you... I'm, I, I, I'm not aware specifically of any patient who has done that, though I know that there are a significant number of people nationally who have done that. I'm not aware of a specific patient who has told me one way or the other, so I wouldn't be able to opine on that. Thank you. Um, 
Please. I have a question about um, the problem and sure. how it's stored and mm -hmm. how it's you uh, distributed in, within the within the business. Mm -hmm. um, you've got uh, vape cartridges which are contained. Mm -hmm. You're not manufacturing them here. You're manufacturing them in cranberry. And they're Correct. Coming in. The MCT oil, same thing. Yep. Concentrates, uh, etc. The flour. Mm -hmm. um, is that in? Is that uh, taken out in bulk in any way, or is it all yeah. packaged up and it's sealed up and it's not used or opened in the shop? So a lot of times on the news, you'll see what people call deli style, which is, I believe, what you're referring to. Yeah, where people are taking out of a large jar. So no, mm -hmm. the, the way that they, it would be coming to Esbury Park would be in sealed with a tamper evidence seal on it jars, ready for the patient to purchase. So there would be no bulk coming. It is in jars ready for the patient to purchase um, in various sizes, but there's no open product that's not being transferred. It's, it's all ready for sale to patients when it would come here. That would all, all that packaging would be occurring in cranberry still. And, and patients cannot use uh, flour in the, in, the, in the building or on site? They, they can, yeah, per the state, uh, I think that's legislation, there, there's no use on premises. Right, yeah. and, uh, and unless you have a consumption lounge upstairs or downstairs. Yeah, which there none of those exist. They right. they just really release the regulations on there, so there's no consumption lines. And so even with the, you said that you coach folks about how to administer and things mm -hmm. like that, but that doesn't involve any actual. You're not. No, no, it'd be showing, demonstrating, using pictures, and the actual tool, but you're never actually consuming on site. So there's so there's because there's no um, exposed flour, let's say, sure, uh, or utilization or processing or repackaging there there's no uh odor or anything that would come from this that would, uh, no absolutely minimal certainly nothing outside of the facility um what's, what's i mean within the vault i think you you will smell that there's cannabis in the vault it's a room filled with it but it certainly not permeating from the building building on the dispensary only within the building you could likely smell some cannabis but it is minimal it is all jarred it is all sealed and the vault has no duct to the outside, there's no uh, air ducts or HVAC or anything in that vault that's gonna... Yeah, I mean, we, we use six, a, a large amount of filtration where there would be, even at our current facility where we're cultivating there, that you can eliminate the smell. So there would be, still be no order. Um, certainly that's gonna be a climate controlled vault for quality control of the products, but through filtration, you can eliminate any smells that would permeate. So um, what type of filters do you use? I think Merv 13, I'm not sure. We use a number of filters. We have a pharmaceutical plume fan at our cranberry facility as well. But again, that's a, a cultivation facility, but we use the highest levels of filters and as well as activated uh, carbon to remove odors. And certainly at our dispensary, that wouldn't be something that's an I mean, issue. Normally the odor controls would have a series of filters. It's not just one filter. It's I, I don't design our HVAC systems. Uh, I'm not entirely sure but i can tell you that at our current satellite facility where we do have hvac in the room there is no odors outside of the building whatsoever and even minimal within the vault because everything is sealed there would somebody from your uh, team be able to describe to the board or demonstrate to the board what kind of filters you would use in that so that they can have uh, some idea about how I, i'm works? sure we could talk to that i don't know if it's in the drawings but i assume it would be in the drawings but yeah it's certainly significant filtration to ensure that there's no i don't, I don't know if it is in the drawings so yeah that, that's outside of my knowledge i think we would obviously also stipulate to work with the board professionals on filtration should that become an issue i'm not an expert on filters but I do, I do know that there are substantial filtering, uh, you know, this, now I'm testifying, I'm not asking a question, but I'm saying in these instances, there are substantial filters and... Uh, yes, and determining the size and sure. the particulates filters. and I yes. understand. It's usually HEPA with carbon uh, activated charcoal as well, which is really good at absorbing and that's changed out and it helps to control any order. But it's also, it's also uh, something where you, you know, you need to have a schedule for replacement because of course. it's, it's got to happen yep. on a regular basis or start smelling. Yep. So you would or wouldn't have somebody able to testify on that? I, I, so, yeah, I mean, we have our engineer here tonight. Obviously, I don't, I assume we will not be finishing tonight. So we're happy to come next meeting with someone from the facility to describe the filtration as well. I think you should be prepared for any questions, right? 
Um, so any more questions from the board professionals? All right, so I'll open it up to the public. Anybody in the public for the testimony of Mr. Froelich, please come to the mic, state your name and address for the My record. name is Avil Robinson, 1025 Third Avenue. I'm a resident for 40 years. A um, couple questions. Um, one it has to relate to, the, to Mr. Froelich's testimony. About the um, facility, right? I want to know why did he come here? Because at this point over there on First Avenue in Memorial is very darkly littered on this side of the tracks. I've been here for 40 years. Asbury has perspired and is doing very well. And this side has accumulated a well-balanced revenue for this side. Now this side, if we all go outside, there's no lights on this side. No lights on this side at all in the town. We can all go out there, there's no lights, as dark as can be. That facility right there is a very darkly lit area. So what made you choose that area? May I ask? Sure, yeah. Um, so when we were selecting the location, we were... Yeah, talk. Yeah. Um, so we, we needed to choose outside of a drug-free school zone. That, that location also offered significant space as well as a, a space for parking, right? Um, Sure, you're aware street parking is pretty tough around here. Right? Correct. That's the next point I'm going to go to. Go yeah. ahead. So we wanted to make sure that we were able to find a facility that was an appropriate size to handle the traffic that we would have, but also a parking lot. So we're not contributing to any issues with street parking in the area. So that, that was a location that was very attractive to us. For oh, okay. So now then I go to the point is, is I'm going through my town, through the, through the streets. It's sure. very trafficy right now. It's very trafficy. You go down, down, go down the streets about 5:30. It's very, it's very dim. You know, speed traffic down Main Street, and then if you come to this side, it's, it's very populated with drugs on this side. They have a long history of drugs on this side of the town. I'm very proud of Asbury what they've done to downtown. Uh, Pat Bassano, Patrick Stackman, all of the guys. But this side that you're coming yes. to is. is do you have a question? The question is, why did he come to this area? What can he actually do for us? But for the community, what, are you going to attribute to the, the school? Are you going to attribute to the students? What, what, you know what I mean? It sounds like it's only a revenue profit for you. Because that side is very darkly lit, and that area is a, a, a very congested area. There's no lights over there. Sure. It's, so it's let him over. answer your question. Yes. Yeah, so we would love to be contributing to the community, whether that's the school or how that works. You know, we're, we're active in our other communities. As I said, we sponsored our arts festival in Roselle Park. We. Um, donated to the library, the fire department, all of those things in Cranberry. And we would really love to be, uh, there's you know community organizations, we would love to be a part of donating to them and helping to develop some of that. As you said, it's very darkly lit. We'd like to bring jobs and you know community events there as well. We, what, we do want to be a part of that community. I'm not against what you're doing at all, but sure. that side is very darkly lit. You know, sure. very darkly lit on that side. Very dark lit. It's, it's, it's very dark lit. <laughs> you very made your dark. point, sir. <laughs> That's and something you have to take up with the city that, and not yeah, with the gentleman. Yeah, as far as lighting, I, I mean, we, that's to our experts on there, and they're going to testify to that. It's, very, it's a crime over there, too. There's a lot of crime over there. All right, you're, you're testifying. Please ask a question. Time's up. <laughs> Hello, Felicia Simmons, um, Asbury Park. Um, Mammoth Ocean County National Action Network, Pan African Chambers of Commerce. And oh, I never heard anyone tell me I'm I'm quiet. <laughs> My name is Felicia Simmons. I am the president of Mammoth Ocean County National Action Network. I am also Pan African Chambers of Commerce and also the newly president of the West Side Community Center on the west side of Asbury Park. A community activist and a busybody. Um, <laughs> Can That's you me. also so please question, provide your address? Oh, Sewell Avenue, Asbury Park, um, which is very close to where the gentleman, you know, I have my other friend in because you see me with my children. Please ask a question. The question is, um, what he was asking the gentleman before me was, what are you going to do specifically for the impact into the town of the west side? When he was specifically asking in his way is that there is heavy traffic and there is no pretty okay, so much. That wasn't part of his testimony. You can ask the questions regarding traffic when we have testimony regarding traffic. Okay. <clears throat> 
also in, in the building and the, the lighting in that facility on that corner, uh, specifically on First Avenue. Um, how would you um, engage the city and put up lighting in that space? Okay, area? again, there are going to be some questions regarding lighting in the testimony. That wasn't part of his testimony. Only questions related to his testimony, Ms. Simmons. Okay, we were talking about zoning previously. I was out the room, so I only had to um, transport. Um, so you were talking about zoning. So the zoning changes in uh, the products not being inside of the school zone in that area, right? Um, inside of it. It's hard to ask the question. All of them are connected. So what I'm going to ask we will is, get to all those we're going to get to situations. those questions. But uh, I just want to engage. I was trying to follow up what he said about the impact of the city and engaging all parts of the community active groups in the city and just the structure. But I'll ask again. Okay, please do. Any further questions from the public? Thank you, Mr. Furlow. Thank you so much for your time. Go ahead, Danny. Okay, um, obviously you want to, thank you. Obviously you want to bring a business to Asbury Park. I want to know um, what are your plans for employment of local, employment and training of local people? Yeah, so in our last side of the dispensary that we opened in Roselle Park, approximately 80% of the people we hired uh, live within 15 minutes of the facility. Um, we would plan on doing the same thing here. There we had a, um, a hiring event uh, directly across the street from our location. So we rented out a local business and had a hiring event there the whole day. Um, really big for us to hire local. Um, so that is absolutely something we'd want to do and again, um, potentially combining that now that we've engaged with that attorney with an expungement event as well. Um, as I said, we really want to hire people with prior convictions, not just cannabis, in terms of giving people a second chance to the extent we're allowed to under state law. Um, but if we were allowed in Asbury Park, we, we would undergo a similar hiring plan where local hiring events, um, you know, happy to open that up to other businesses to do that in conjunction as well. Um, that's something that's important to us and that would be our plan is to be hiring people from within that immediate proximity. Okay, D judging the demographics of the community and the hiring process, would you be willing to put security guards in your parking lot? If that was something the town required, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Furlick. Thank um, you. So I think actually this is a good place for us to stop. Um, since we're not going to complete this application before the time allotted, um, we, uh, I, I suggest we carry this at this point, um, since we completed your testimony, Mr. Prolet, I'm pretty sure we wouldn't finish somebody else's at this point before the 10 o'clock de deadline. So um, I'm going to suggest we carry it. What do we have at this point? I'm going to say February. Is that correct, Marie? Um, that is correct. We have um, February 14th or February 28th. Uh, sooner the better. <laughs> Um, if everybody is available for Valentine's Day, <laughs> can't think of a better way. To I'm spend not it. sure that's the best day. <laughs> you may not want Valentine's Day because people may be busy. Uh, it's just a suggestion. I defer to you on that. Uh, I know you guys want to. I'm fine with it. Go with it. Yeah. Yeah, we'll go with that, please. You'll go with Valentine's yes. Day. Okay. So right. February 14th it is, uh, Mr. Chairman. That's it. Okay, so I'll make a motion to carry the breakwater application to February 14th, 2023, without further notes. I'll, I'll second. second. Oh. <laughs> I'll let Russell have the second. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, Daniel Harris? Yes. Jill Potter? Yes. Wendy Glassman? Yeah. John Scully? Yes. Jose Alcaraz? Yes. Russell Lewis? Yes. Christopher Avalani? Yes. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, I quickly make an announcement that those folks that were here for the application, there will be no further notice. The next meeting is February 14th. And do we have your agreement to carry? Uh, uh, yeah, we waive any. Do you waive any rights? Yeah. And I'll make a motion to adjourn the meeting. I'll second. Just a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.